So we are now joined by Chief Constable Rachel Swan to answer some of the questions that the public have submitted on antisocial behaviour. I know that this issue is an issue that affects our residents in the city, in towns, villages and our rural communities. And it is important to you as it is important to me and I know it's important to Rachel. So in terms of what you think the biggest challenges are with tackling antisocial behaviour as the chief of this force, what would you say that they are? Well, I'm, I'm going to allow myself a moment, Nicole, just to say and just to reiterate something that both you've said and Michelle have said. Um, antisocial behaviour, when I became chief, I set it as a priority and I've continued to set it as an operational priority throughout my time here. And it's regardless of the numbers that are reported to us because antisocial behaviour affects quality of life for people and feelings of safety. It's therefore really important to the public, so it must be really important to us. And I just really wanted to reiterate my commitment. In terms of challenges, I guess that's a wider answer around um, trying to make sure that we continue to tackle antisocial behaviour and the things that matter to communities whilst balancing some of the other issues that are really high harm and high risk. Um, and that's really why I put um, antisocial behaviour as an operational priority, because it means it still gets that additional resource, it still gets that additional focus. Yes. The challenge for policing is ever-increasing demand, ever-complexity of demand, with a set number of resources and a set number of finance. But it's really why I set out right at the beginning why it's important to me and why I want it to continue to be important to the force. Yes. I know that Michelle actually touched on some of the funding that runs out mm. in 2025, and I know we've we've sat in meetings looking at how we embed some of that, yeah. how, you know, what can we keep in the business as usual? What can we retain? Yes. And, and it's not going to be easy. So I know no. that the funding challenge across the board in my office and indeed yours is something that we're definitely going to have to contend with. Absolutely. But, yeah, hopefully the government as well, in terms of it being a priority for the government, that will aid us in some of the work that we want to do. In yes, the next absolutely. Of absolutely. I hope so. Um, <clears throat> but making some of the hotspot activities, business as usual for our safer neighbour teams is a good step forward in terms of a baseline for some of that. Yeah. No, thank you for that. I mean, I obviously have questions that I ask you all of the time in our meetings. You do. Um, at the constabulary, but today is about the public and the yep. questions that they have. So my first question is in regards to drug dealing and misuse. So residents in areas like Amber Valley and Derby City report ongoing drug dealing, antisocial behaviour and intimidation yet feel like police action has been seen over, se well, very little police action mm. has been seen over the past several years. What is being done to ensure that these communities feel protected and that there is a visible presence? Yes, and I mean, they do actually highlight quite an important point, which you say to me quite often around, actually do a lot of this activity, but how are we feeding it back? Can we feed it back better? So there is a reminder in there in terms of making sure we're telling the community what we're doing. Because certainly in the areas that you talk about, um, the City Safer Neighbourhood teams have been really proactive over the last year. Um, they've arrested over 23 drug dealers, um, they've mapped the drugs network <clears throat> and they've used a number of tactics in order to target and to, to identify those um, offenders. Not all is a visible presence, which does contribute to people thinking they've not necessarily seen something. So there's been an awful lot in terms of plain coat closed patrols, enabling them to get close enough to suspects to identify and, and arrest them. Um, <clears throat> the drugs picture changes constantly, so they do a lot of work to gather intelligence and they rely on intelligence coming in from the community, so yes. like Michelle, I would always encourage people to report information to us. Um, but we're also proactively working with partners um, in order to tackle this problem so that, for example, um, we can together go to locations of drug-related ASB and try to improve security there and target those who... Um, use that opportunity to exploit vulnerable people in that circumstance to try and protect those at risk. We also make really good use of preventative orders, such as criminal behaviour orders, which then bans that individual from causing harm to the community and entering certain areas. So once we've got um, a CBO, it gives us a power of arrest if it's, there's a breach and then we can prosecute those people. Yes. And certainly um, 43 have been issued within Derbyshire in the last financial year. Okay. And then we've already touched upon Op Shango, which is an antisocial behaviour operation and that area has been one of those areas that's benefited from those patrols. Okay. Now, in terms of, I guess, drug dealing in public spaces, we've also got residents in saying areas like St. Clair's Close and under bridges, for example, in mm. Alveston, 
they are, you know, whilst we're saying that there's a lot of progress, they're also saying, well, we're seeing it done out in the open. Mm. And obviously that, that then, you know, discourages people from either taking their families into those Absolutely. spaces. And, and they feel like, you know, how can we be tougher? Because they feel like, you know, things yeah. just seem to be unchecked. And like we're saying, there is a lot that we are doing in this space. So what are these activities, why are these activities allowed to persist in broad daylight? And they're saying, well, what are the barriers that prevent policing from taking action when in incidences they don't? Okay, so previously St. Clair's Close um, was an area we focused on. and We've not had any reports recently. So if there's an ongoing concern, again, I would encourage that person to report it to us because it's not featuring in our reporting and therefore we're not necessarily targeting that although we have done previously yes. in terms of the Safer Neighbourhood Team's patrol strategy and also some of the problem solving that they do. Um, we do carry out surveys through Derbyshire Alert um, with local residents to measure it, the extent of problems when they're reported to us. Okay. And then we work with partners in a problem solving approach to tackle all the elements within it because clearly we can do the enforcement, but actually the enforcement is always a short term mm. gain. Actually, there's a long-term problem that needs to be solved in terms of vulnerability, or sometimes it's it's issues around the location that makes it attractive to that sort of activity. Um, and as I say, we, we work across all the safer neighbourhood teams in that problem-solving approach to try to tackle these issues, to prevent them in the long term as opposed to short-term removal, and yes. then it comes back again, as probably is an example here with St Clair's Close. Yes. So I think, you know, looking at some of the questions that were coming in, mm. there were some consistent themes around, you know, drug dealing and also just support for people who, you know, are addicted to drugs or yes. are battling um, drug abuse. And I just think the, there's a holistic approach to this as well that doesn't solely rely on the police. No. So whilst we, you know, we're picking up on the things that we would, what residents would like to see done differently, you know, there is a holistic approach that mm. includes how do we actually support people to you know, get them off drugs and, yeah. and substance misuse. And actually, as a community, there is a lot of work that needs to happen in partnership, which we do, yes. um, which we do already. So what we have also is a question around inconsistency between police promises and action. So this is <clears throat> following drug busts in areas like, for example, Beckett Street. Mm. Uh, people, residents said they were promised increased patrols that they felt haven't materialized. And I know from, from some of the meetings that we've had, you know, sometimes, you know, I'll use myself for an example. I'll sometimes go to a police station and see certain police officers, but not see others. Yeah. So some may, may think they've yeah. never met me before, but is that the case? Or are, are they, is it that the residents are feeling something different or is it that sometimes we're there at different times? You know, yeah. you tell us. It's, it is diff it's difficult, isn't it? Because it's a very, very large county and you, sometimes you think, you know, I don't see a police officer and then you see a police officer all the time. And, you know, we have good instances where people have walked up and down the street and they say, I've never seen them and they will show, actually, we've been up and down that street many times. But that's kind of not the issue. It's the feeling that comes with it that's yes. not being seen. And that's the bit that needs to, to be addressed. So um, just for some reassurance on Beckett Street area, there have been high visibility patrols in that area. Okay. Um, obviously, where we patrol depends on the threat and risk and what information is coming in in terms of our strategy around it. So again, if there are concerns, um, I, I you know, would encourage people to, to continue to report them. Um, we do tackle, as we say, we do tackle... Um, drug offending. We try to tackle those people who are distributing the drugs and selling the drugs as opposed to simply try to prosecute drug users because as you've said actually that's not really tackling the issue is it. We need to help with partners to get those people to prevent them from in the first place from being drug users and target those who are supplying them and certainly the neighbourhood um, actually neighbourhood teams, the safer neighbourhood teams do a lot of work in terms of managing those issues because drugs and ASB related to drugs is an issue that's quite a common theme throughout all of the neighbours and concerns. Okay. So in terms of community <clears throat> safety and protection of children, there are some residents who are saying that they see drugs on footpaths, um, around schools. So they talk around, you know, serious concerns around actually, and I touched on this a bit earlier, you know, people don't want to take their families into mm. particular areas and they don't want their children to be exposed to, you know, drug paraphernalia on the floors yep. and and uh, you know we wouldn't want to see that and I'm sure you know parents are really concerned about this issue what steps are being taken to address these hazards yeah so um I was this question related to the Normanton area um and we are aware of this issue and there is a problem um management plan in place so this isn't just us and the enforcement as I've said what we've got um 
partners such as the park staff and the drugs outreach workers um, so that we can have a positive impact in the area. So for instance, we're aware of the number of needles being discarded. So it's looking at, well, how do we deal with this? You know, we can do some high profile patrols to give short term reassurance, but actually longer term, we need longer solutions. So would needle bins be a solution? But if we put needles bins there, it's almost accepting that there is a problem. You know, and some people might think, well, there's a perception you're accepting it and you put the bins there. But actually, the primary concern might be safety and safety for children around there. So um, that's why it's really important we work with the council when there are specific areas so that those feelings of safety can be tackled so that people feel, I can use my neighbourhood and I can, you know, use these, these areas for my children safely. No, it's definitely something that has come up a few times, mm. especially in the city. And it is a real concern. Mm. And, is there anything we, that we could be doing with the councils or? Well, I think um, we do work really closely with the council. So where we've got a problem management plan, we'll link in with the local users and uh, quite often we'll see what data they have as well. So Michelle talked about some of the sun, uh, funding streams around safer streets. Good examples there are, um, you might say, well, there isn't sufficient lighting, so it gives feelings of, of, um, that you're not feeling safe or you know everything or, or the foliage is all sort of reaching over and people don't feel safe to go in those areas so we work mm. to improve the um, location in itself and then look at what other issues there are within it to tackle that. Okay well thank you for that I mean again on the topic of, of drugs um, I've actually had a few bits of casework on this myself, but you know another question came in in regards to cannabis mm -hmm. and actually what the laws are and what our policy is. Yeah. So just to go to the question, public cannabis use has become normalised and we had residents from areas such as Bowles over saying, despite it being illegal, we're still seeing you know, the use of cannabis, for example. Has there been a shift in the enforcement policy and what is the force's position? So no change in our policy. Uh, cannabis is a class B, B drug and therefore it is an offence to possess, supply or cultivate it. Um, and we take action where we find those offences, for example. Um, enforcement action doesn't always mean arrest. There can be alternative disposals, as, as we've talked about before. It really depends on the circumstance of each case. Um, but this is one of those things in terms of, I go back to, we want to really tackle those who are supplying. So um, we do an awful lot of work to identify the, those people, um, as talked about within the City Safer Neighbourhood team, and really try to cut that distribution off, as well as tackling where we see some offences in front of us, or indeed cultivation, which we see quite commonly. And I think that's actually a good point that you make, and I know we touched on it earlier with immediate justice. You know, there's a lot of out of court disposals mm. that are available and whilst obviously we want to see a, a stronger approach and more punitive sometimes yeah. enforcement there are other ways that we can effect change yes. and give justice that also affords reoffenders the opportunity to not get into the criminal justice Completely. system and actually come out of whatever scenario they found themselves in in a better position and you know that 80 percent success rate yes. on the immediate justice shows that you know it is effective. Mm. So while sometimes people want to see people arrested, I just it's also just a reminder that there are other ways that are effective in you know punishment that actually give us results in our communities. Absolutely, but really just to reiterate, particularly those who are supplying and cultivating, we you know absolutely justice uh, in terms of um, arrest and prosecution is the way. Oh no, definitely. I think that's something that has featured in my mm. police and crime plan. The public have already told me that they want us to tackle drug dealing and substance misuse and, and what we want to see is more seizures yeah we definitely want more drugs off our streets and to be able to support people that are affected mm. and impacted by them so residents also wanted to talk about antisocial behavior when it comes to illegal and dangerous vehicle modifications uh, residents across various areas including the high peak and Erewash, are mm -hmm. concerned about off-road vehicles scrambling bikes and cars with illegal modifications such as loud exhaust and altered number plates. Why are these drivers not being prosecuted more frequently? And what's being done to address the damage and danger these vehicles pose? So um, a couple of years ago, we invested in uh, a number of off-road motorcycles because um, this has come up as a persistent problem in terms of antisocial behavior. Um, and those off-road motorcycle team um, who work within the Rose Policing Unit work closely with the local safer neighborhood teams where there is a reported issue on that. Um, and we deploy, we interact with the illegal uh, motorists, we seize vehicles, and we report them for any offences that are identified. Um, again, this is one where 
we encourage people to get in touch with us because if this is an issue, we have a capability and a capacity to go and deal with it. And we do deal with it quite robustly and effectively. So um, I would really encourage um, reporting on that. Exhaust on vehicles can be very frustrating um, and they do cause disturbance, although a loud exhaust is not necessarily linked to causing road casualties or, or, um, or injuries on the road. But having said that, if we come across a particularly noisy exhaust, we challenge the driver on it <clears throat> and we require to them, them to have it modified if it's found to be illegal. Um, and then we, um, we check to ensure the insurance company are aware that any modifications they may have made to their vehicle as well, because obviously it, it affects their... Um, so I just really would want to say it's not something we ignore, um, it's something that where there is opportunity we will tackle, but sometimes a noisy and exhaust in itself isn't an illegal aspect. Mm. Okay, so on that, carrying on that, on the sound of, no on the sound of noise, carrying on with the topic yeah. around noise, um, communities in places like Hathersage, the Hope Valley, Madlock Bath, mm. say they are consistently disrupted mm. by excessively loud motorcycles and cars speeding through less populated areas. Mm -hmm. um, what actions are the police taking to curb this antisocial behaviour, particularly on weekends where these issues are most prevalent? Yes, uh, and this is reported to us frequently and it is a particular priority for the safe and neighbourhood teams who work there. Um, <clears throat> so Derbyshire, particularly Matlock and the Peak District, the roads are really attractive to motorcyclists, okay? Um, they are sweeping, they are flowy, uh, flowing, spectacular scenery, you know, one of the benefits of Derbyshire. Um, but it does mean they have been, and always have been, really attractive to motorcyclists. And there's some statistics that says about a third of the population in the UK lives within an hour of the Peak District. So it's very accessible to a high number of people. And we, we even have people coming from Europe, motorcyclists, to ride the roads here. Um, so as a, and as a result, um, a significant amount of the local economy is built upon the trade of those people coming into the county. Um, you know, Matlock um, in particular is really busy with motorcyclists uh, around a bank, a bank holiday Monday. You know, it's a key part of their business. So, you know, all of that is borne in mind. Um, it's not illegal for those motorcyclists to be on the road. It's not illegal for a group of motorcyclists to be on the road. But... An exhaust can be quite loud, even if it's legal. Take a group of exhausts together. It is loud for that population there, although um, not illegal. We do an awful lot to engage with motorcyclists, to educate motorcyclists. Um, we do a lot in terms of trying to target those, as I say, who've adapted um, their exhaust to make it particularly loud. Um, you know, we, we try to try to tackle that. And we really do focus on um, the road safety and safe riding um, and responsible riding of motorcyclists. And there are a number of programmes we do to, to encourage and support that. So in itself, a motorcyclist and the noise it creates is not necessarily illegal. And I think that's really the point. But I do appreciate that the riding in numbers and the noise it makes is difficult for people. So that's where we try to do a lot of engagement to encourage um, responsible motorcycling. Yes. I'm just yes, I'm just just checking. You know, the element that I think also was highlighted was around that speeding side mm. of things, and obviously, it's been a challenge, especially in recent months. We know that we have uh, motorcyclists that are yes. killed or seriously injured on our roads, and it's a real concern for for people and for families and for those that have lost loved ones um, on the roads. So, in terms of speeding, I guess you know if you could just shine a light on some of the work that we're doing in that space to kind of reduce yeah um so uh as you said there's a there's a high proportion of fatalities um within the county and unfortunately a high proportion of the fatalities are, are motorcyclists or related to, to motorcycle um riding so um the roads policing unit the casualty reduction enforcement teams known as crest um, along with the safer neighbourhood teams, do an awful lot of work in terms of regular speed enforcement, particularly around um, the dales at particular hotspots. So we use statistics in terms of what's reported to us from the community, some of the things around community speed watch, the information we have around injuries and accidents, um, but also you know community concerns to build up a picture of where are the hotspots that we need to deploy in order to prevent these these casualties. Um, so staff regularly patrol um, Matlock Bath, for example. Um, and what I would say is where we do see examples of antisocial behaviour riding of bikes, we use a body-worn video and then we use that in order to prosecute people. Um, we, the Crest as well, they run um, the Upright Motorcycle Safety Campaign. We do the Fatal 4 activity as well within that area. Um, 
probably that area of the county gets more activity around not just speeding but about all the elements connected with safety on our roads mm. because it is so attractive and you know we still do even though we're working in partnership with the you know um with others within the county it's still a high rate of killed and seriously injured there so it's something that absolutely focuses our activity and focuses crest and the road policing unit okay We've also got someone who has submitted a question on off-road bikes and quads in places like Balpa and Bolsover. Mm. So worried about the risks for pedestrians and dog walkers. And I guess how can the public report these incidences more effectively is what people are asking because they're thinking, you know, is it serious enough to call 999? So people will go, well, it's, they aren't in direct threat. Yeah. You know, so what is the best ways for people to report incidences such as these and what strategies are in place to deter such behaviour in public spaces? So, um, 999 is always for an emergency. Yes. Okay. And I, I think, you know, we'd want to make that clear. We have a number of other routes, which Michelle uh, outlined earlier in terms of reporting. So, 101 and online, and we do chats with people as well. Um, whatever is, comes into us is recorded and then passed on to the Safer Neighbour team. So, I would absolutely encourage people to report that. And in terms of people saying uh, the off road bikes, I've referred to my earlier answer in terms of we do have that off-road capability for antisocial behaviour and we do tackle yes. it if we know about it. So very much encourage that reporting. Okay. So we have areas in Sunning Hill, some residents feel that they are plagued by boy races uh, and modified vehicles. So this really it, it does seem to come up a lot in antisocial behaviour mm. in terms of the questions that we've had submitted. Um, what measures are being take, What measures are being put in place to stop illegal races? So, and, and I mean, you would have to define what that is because we've just touched on the fact that it's not illegal for, you know, no. motorists to congregate. And so they're saying, how do you stop illegal races and ensure the safety of residents? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so um, I will refer back to some of the earlier answers I've given in terms of problem management plans, um, activity of the Safer Neighbourhood teams, activity of the Roads Policing Unit, activity of the off-road bikes, uh, activity of our on-road bikes because we obviously have that visible capability yes and then um, where there are particular concerns in terms of sometimes you car cruises and things like that we can look in, in terms of specific operations which we do have in place or there are sometimes some more civil prevention orders that we can do to prevent these activities okay in terms of so I think we're, we're moving away from um, vehicles off-road mm -hmm. bikes um, and this topic slightly. Um, we have had residents from areas such as Amber Valley, North East Derbyshire, highlight the issue of parking. Mm. Now, I, I, I hear about this in a lot of different places around, you know, improper parking on pavements, outside schools, and just the concern around, for example, outside schools, yeah. children. Um, the issue, <coughs> we well, you know, it's primarily a council uh, responsibility, yeah. but we know that there are some areas where the police can interject, and it, it then you know comes into the policing yeah. space. How are you educating motorists to reduce these nu nuisances in residential areas? Yeah, so you are you are right. Um, parking and parking enforcement is primarily a local council um, responsibility. We do take primacy in certain situations, depending on the on the issue, um, and that would be in terms of dangerous aspects of it, for example. Um, I would always encourage people to report it to the council for them to take appropriate action. But if there's something that relates to um, persistent or residual issue, and, and schools is a good example there, because sometimes our safer neighbour teams will go into schools to support them in the action they'll take to educate people in terms of how they're dropping off their children. Yes. Um, you know, because it, it becomes, I say from personal experience, very frantic at school drop off time. And, you know, people, in essence, if, if they're not careful, they, they can cause a danger to, to people crossing the road or they can block people's drives over, which is a nuisance when people want to get out for themselves. So um, we will work um, alongside their schools to support the schools, you know, with specific activity. Um, but if it's a dangerous situation, that's the situation where, you know, we would, we would absolutely get involved within that. Okay. In places like Chesterfield and Mickley, poorly parked and dangerously ridden e-scooters and e-bikes are becoming a common nuisance. How will the police ensure that laws are enforced to maintain public safety and there are plans to target enforcement and campaigns to tackle these issues? I mean, e-scooters is definitely something that has come up a lot yes. um, in my time yep. already. And I know that we're doing a lot you know, in partnership, yep. but there are a lot 
of issues that are have arisen through you know yeah. e-scooters being flagged as an issue but we are doing a lot so I'll, <coughs> we know, are in terms uh, of assurance for residents you know yeah so what I does mean, that look it's like a, it's a just a little bit of reassurance i think for the public that the um issues caused with uh, e-scooters is something that's well known to us and something that we're, we're quite committed to tackle i just want to clarify the difference between e-scooters and e-bikes e-bikes are in for to all intents and purposes a pedal cycle and therefore not subject to the same um, um, uh, legislation on the roads, although you know some aspects of it they are. So I just want to clarify there's a difference between the two. It is illegal to ride an e-scooter anywhere other than private land with the landowner's permission, and that's obviously not the case for e-bikes. So um, recognising this and some of the concerns we've, we've both had raised from members of the public, um, we've put in place a specific operation to take a more robust approach to e-scooters because Previously, on the first occasion, we would warn and then we would seize on the second occasion. We're now, as soon as if we, we come to a situation where we are able to safely stop an e-scooter, we will seize that um, uh, that e-scooter and take it from them and then consider what offences we're prosecuting for. Um, but we're also doing an awful lot in terms of education and enforcement, education and prevention, because that's a better route. Um, you know, it's not illegal to sell one, for example. Um, and whilst you and I are considering how we can lobby um, to improve legislation around this, and we were hopeful there would be, you know, um, furtherance of legislation at this point. We're not in that situation, so we need to do what we can proactively um, in the situation that we are. So there's a campaign where we, I've given um, designated greater powers to the PCSOs because previously they weren't able to stop vehicles like that. They are now able to. We've trained them so that they can um, do that safely. Um, and legally, so that they're again equipped to deal with the e-scooters because they're they're the visible presence out in the neighbourhoods, and they're more likely to come across it. So, yes. you know, we want a greater capacity and capability to tackle what we've got in front of them. But it's just really to um, educate people in terms of the illegal aspect of it, because I don't think many people understand what I've just said about it's illegal anywhere other than on a private uh, land. Um, and really, you know, prevent those sales in the first place. And the last thing I want is coming up to Christmas, people, parents are buying their children a very expensive e-scooter only to find that as soon as they use it, we're seizing it. Yes. You know, I'd rather it didn't happen in the first place. No, definitely. I, I think we're in the same space around educating mm. people and people knowing the law around this. And unfortunately, you know, we are limited in what we can do, but we are lobbying. Yeah. So it's definitely a joint effort. And hopefully, you know, our residents will start to feel the difference mm. and see the difference. And I know that we've already started we seizing have. and then indeed disposing of e-scooters. So that is definitely a step in the right direction. And I know that residents will welcome that. Mm. So on the topic of e-scooters, and I know we've already touched on, on drug dealing um, early on, mm. there are concerns that e-scooters are being used by young people for drug-related activities and other illegal purposes. What intelligence do the police have on this issue and what actions are being taken to prevent their use in criminal activity? Yeah, so just uh, I guess to reassure the public, we are aware that e-scooters can be a um, way of committing a crime you know, um, in terms of um, easy access, in terms of routes and getting to places. So it's not just in terms of linked to drugs, they'll be linked to other crimes as well. So we link all of that with our intelligence systems um, uh, to tile that up. So if we were tackling a drug problem, which we, I talked about earlier, within the city centre, for example, if that's a method by which people are using in order to enable an activity, then we would vary our tactics to try to deal with that. Okay. So it is something we're aware of. I'd encourage continued reporting, but then we adapt ourselves tactically to deal with whatever we're faced with. Yeah, and I mean in terms of pro, you know to prevent their use as well. I suppose even the uh, new way of approach in Derbyshire will be helpful. Absolutely, actually in ridding them off our streets and actually improper use then becomes less likely because yeah. they are no longer on our streets. So you know. Yeah. Even from my perspective, I would really encourage uh, residents to continue to report that. And definitely now that our PCSOs are going to be trained up to yeah. be able to dispose and discard of them as well, then let's ensure that people are speaking to their PCSOs and sharing intel because those are the people who are in our communities. Yes. Um, in terms of residents in North East Derbyshire, they ask what the best course of action is for concerned citizens who witness behaviour such as, you know, the unsafe use of mm. e-scooters, whether that's at night, you know, thinking about um, those that are um, disabled or vulnerable or mm. are elderly, you know, 
I guess, what reassurances do we have? I know we've touched on it, but I, I just thought I would definitely ask this question because it, yeah. it was also just around, you know, protecting our most vulnerable uh, and how we essentially advise those are concerned about that. Yeah, and, and um, my answer is, again, report it to us because, um, you know, so if we see all of this, um, you report on 101 or online, um, unless obviously there's an emergency, and then... I guess if we see consistent reporting from someone, you know, sometimes it, it, we can see a vulnerability around a location or a person, and then we can look at, well, what other things can we do in terms of problem solving that? But without the information coming in, we can't identify, mm. you know, that person or that vulnerability um, and, and deal with it. And, you know, sometimes I, I, I have letters from the public or, or complaints that come through, and, and only recently I had something where uh, uh, an elderly lady felt she was being targeted for ASB, and actually, you know, we were able to follow it up and, and the Safer Neighbourhood team didn't just deal with the antisocial behaviour, they put in place with partners some other support that that lady needed. So that's what I'm saying, yes. it's quite a holistic approach okay. um, when we know about it. Brilliant. So it is just continue to report yeah. because sometimes these incidences happen and people go, well, hmm. I'm sure they reported it in or passers by, you know, people who will Not see an incident. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if everyone <clears throat> assumes that something has been reported and then don't report, that doesn't mean it has been reported. Hmm. So, you know, I, I don't think you can report an incident enough, essentially, you know, to ensure that the police are yeah. aware. Yeah. Um, in terms of a few more, so I've, I've got a few more questions for you. And these are... Definitely not around kind of vehicle use, e-scooters mm -hmm. and drugs, but neighbour disputes. Yes. And I guess collaboration with housing associations. You know, I talk to residents all the time, whether that's in meetings or, you know, when I'm out in the community. And there have been incidences of neighbour disputes and, and how we can collaboratively work with housing mm -hmm. associations. So I've got many residents feel that housing associations are not doing enough to address antisocial behaviour in their areas. How is Derbyshire Police working with housing associations to ensure a coordinated response and what improvements are needed in this partnership? And I know obviously neighbour disputes don't only happen in housing associations, no. you've got private landlords, yeah. or indeed where you own your own property. Yeah. But you know, what are the police doing in this space? So um, it's interesting, I remember um, going on patrol with a PCSO at Swadnico and she said when she was joined, she was surprised at how many neighbour disputes she deals with. So it's... it's um, um, just a, a bit of reassurance that it is something that we deal with and we deal with regularly, particularly within the safer neighbourhood teams. So part of that, as you've sort of articulated, is um, it really depends on the residence you're in uh, or type of property you're in, who owns it, um, you know, in terms of what we can deal with. So we um, work very closely with housing associations to tackle antisocial behaviour. Um, we've got good examples and examples in Buxton where we work successfully to close down certain locations where there's been huge amount of community concern talking about antisocial behaviour and drugs use at certain locations. You know, um, we'll have a problem management plan and we will invite relevant people, relevant parties to that in order to sort it out holistically. Um, so just a, a, I guess some reassurance for the public that if there's a relevant partner in it, such as, I don't know, housing association or local council, we'll invite those to the meeting to be part of it to tackle that longer term. Okay. No, thank you for that um, answer. The next topic really is around antisocial behaviour by businesses. So this was an interesting question from a resident. Antisocial behaviour is often associated with individuals, but in some areas, businesses are responsible mm. for disruptive behaviour that affects residents. What can the police do to hold businesses accountable for antisocial actions? And why does it seem there's less focus on that type of ASB? Um, okay, so we do, uh, ASB isn't necessarily against an, uh, um, one individual. Sometimes when we do the problem management, it's a location. Yes. And certain locations can give rise to groups of people gathering, for example, and then subsequent antisocial behavior. So. When I said we have a relevant meeting, we look at all parties within it. So yes. sometimes you'll find reports around a licensed premises and we will work with licensing and the licensing authorities to successfully deal with some of those premises. Occasionally it's closing down premises, for example. Yeah. Um, alternatively, it might be with a business where um, groups of younger people like to gather outside um, at a particular shop. So we'll then work with the shop, say, well, what can we do to stop the gathering? Because the gathering itself, there may be nothing wrong with it, but then it may lead to littering, it may be, lead to feelings of concern, people may feel fear going in there. So yes. we work with the business to say, well, what can we do to, to 
um, try to resolve that so that we don't end up having the groups or those feelings that are within it. Mm. So it really just depends on the situation, but it needn't be one individual. It can be a location that's looked at and a problem solving approach to that location. Okay. So I'll, I'll do one more question um, from the public. And as I said earlier to members of the public who did submit questions, some of those have formed casework and will be written up and published on my website. So rest assured, if you've not heard your question answered today, that the questions will be answered and delivered to you shortly. But in terms of increasing police presence in parishes, this will be my last question mm -hmm. for you, Rachel. Many communities are calling for more officers on the beat, <clears throat> whether that's the city, village, towns, rural communities, but particularly in smaller parishes. Mm. When can residents expect to see a greater police presence in these areas? Yes, and I remember I talked uh, earlier on about the geography of the county, um, you know, is, uh, is a challenge, is what I would say, you know, as is any other um, sort of big rural county. So we have benefit, benefited from national uplift. Um, our baseline is 2,220 officers. And that's back to the same number of officers we had in 2010. Mm -hmm. So I kind of put it like that in terms of we've gone down, we've, we've gone up to those. Uh, they are in a variety of roles um, across the police services and increases, you know, aren't just within the um, visible presence. Some of those are within the protective services of which, you know, vulnerability, for example, and public protection are areas of business that have grown immensely for policing over the last few years. Um, but visibility is one of the things that uh, the public talk about quite a lot and it's one of the challenges I give to Michelle in terms of being the lead in this area that we need to create a visible presence. So we've got a new electronic system called VisiBeat um, and that tracks officers in particular patrol areas and it's available to the public um, and it will particularly track safe and neighbour teams. You, you can see oh, there's been a police presence in my area because yes. you might not see them if you're not looking out the window at that moment in time. But at the same time, it's quite reassuring if you can see, well, they have been patrolling my yes. neighbourhood. They have been patrolling in my location. And given the parishes and the spread out nature of some of the parishes within the, the county, you know, that, that's definitely something that um, I would encourage people to look at so they can see, you know, we do patrol a large amount of the area. Mm -hmm. um, there is a visible presence. It just might not always be there when, we, um, um, when you're looking out the window or where you happen to be outside. Um, we also do a lot in terms of um, using Derbyshire Alert to get messages through around what we're doing um, and also to listen to people. We have community liaison events. Yes. Um, we have uh, events where the local neighbourhood teams will um, go to certain locations at certain times to, in order to encourage the community to talk to them. And again, these are all things that we're trying to do to be visible and accessible put to the public so that people can come and talk to us and also feel a sense that we are there, we are listening to them and we're tackling the problems that um, matter to them. No, thank you for that, because it is something that does really come up a lot. Mm -hmm. And it came up, you know, during my campaign and it continues to come up. We know that the government have uh, committed to delivering more police presence and yeah. presence in our communities. And, and we're all working together to see what that looks like and how quickly yeah. we can deliver that for our communities. But as it stands, obviously, with the resources that we have and the geography that we have mm -hmm. to police, we, we're currently doing... And I, and I can say this from also, you know, speaking to a lot of the officers as well, since taking up this role, a lot of people are doing a lot that, of what they can with, with what they have. And there's a lot of yeah. will and hard work and really commitment to our communities and delivering. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that, you know, we, we, we should be proud of is that we have maintained number of police staff in our neighbours. It's not just about the officers, it's about the police staff that work within our neighbourhoods. Yes. And we've maintained those numbers despite the financial challenges. Yes. Because we recognise the importance that community get from them in terms of feelings of safety and confidence in policing. Yes. No, thank you so much for your answers today, You're very Rachel. Welcome. We really, really appreciate your time. In terms of next steps, thank you again. Uh, thank you to Michelle for giving us an overview on the work that's been happening in our communities. We have a lot to do, but there is a lot of progress in this space. And I would just like to reiterate to the public, you know, if you'd like to get in touch with me or my office, please do so. If you'd like to also get in touch with, with Rachel and indeed the constabulary, please also do so. Our details are available online. So again, don't hesitate to get in touch. Our next public assurance meeting will be in a couple of months, so we hope to see more questions from you on that topic. That topic will be disclosed 
shortly. But thank you very much for tuning in today. And thank you to those who submitted questions on antisocial behavior. It is not an easy topic. It is you know, a challenge that all partners are working together on to reduce and tackle. But I genuinely believe that if we continue to communicate, if we continue to report these incidences, one, we can get the resources where we need them. But two, we can ensure that our communities are safer, no matter where in Derbyshire you are. So thank you for your time.